Dan is a professor at Georgetown University in the States. He's the one who mesmerized me, so I have, uh, we are here because of you as well, Dan. Okay. As I said at the beginning, we are normal people here, okay, meaning, you know, try to be as uh, simple as you can. I'm sure you will. And uh, the audience is yours. No pressure. Okay. Okay? okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. A very warm applause for our speaker, please, please. One second. The magic touch. Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Sotiris. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am very honored to be here tonight and very happy in front of this distinguished audience. And uh, for that, I would like to thank you, Sotiris, for inviting me. And definitely to Ioan from Qualitans and the whole team at Qualitans <coughs> who sponsored and are, uh, are supporting me. They are very forward looking and they are not afraid to look at very new technologies and also on social and philosophical aspects. And that's rare usually in, uh, in technology. Okay, so tonight what we're gonna talk about is, let's see if this is gonna work. We have very interesting subjects, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, and singularity. Um, these are, okay, it works. These are very interesting and very popular subjects. In the same time, they are very complex and very much intertwined. And I thought that in order to be able to do, I don't have too much time. He gave me only 60 minutes or so, and there is a lot of material. <clears throat> I thought that in order to be able to convey uh, the complexity of these uh, subjects, I divided the presentation in three parts. At the beginning, we'll talk about artificial intelligence and the state of the art, a little bit of history, how it came about. Then we'll talk about transhumanism and singularity and their radical claims, indeed radical claims, and we'll see what does it mean. And finally, we'll do you know, we'll end with the, the main, trying to answer the main question <coughs> Are the existential threats or not? Because a lot of people, there is a lot of hype about them being existential threats. So we need to unpack this hype. So, <clears throat> um, they are popular. And somehow, there is a question. Why would they be so popular, this, uh, this subject? First of all, it's cool. Artificial intelligence and all these subjects about transhuman and singularity, it's cool. It's a combination of technology, philosophy, uh, science fiction, and you name it. And a lot of people like it. And this is interesting that if you go two centuries back, in the 18th and 19th century, it was a different thing which was popular then. Uh, you know, it was uh, steam engines, electrical engines, why? Because the society was moving from an agrarian society to an industrial society during the Industrial Revolution. Well, now we are in the middle of a similar transformation, maybe more profound. We are moving into the information era, in the information revolution. And uh, that has significant implications, as we will see later on. Also, they are popular because this subject have a lot to do with our everyday life and will have even more moving forward. Um, and also, the third reason I believe is that it generated an extraordinary, extraordinary enthusiasm about what can be done and uh, did some validation for this transhumanism and singularity, which I'm gonna define later on. Transhumanism is a techno-futurist movement that makes very radical claims about the future of mankind. Why? Because they believe that the remarkable technological developments which are happening right now will generate so many new things which will have effect on um, the humans the way they are in such a way that eventually would end up with a post-human race. And uh, we'll, we'll unpack also this. But it's connected with artificial intelligence because it has to do with intelligence on a different substrate than, than carbon, on silicon. 
And people believe that that has a lot of effects. And if you add to that the developments in uh, genetics, they believe that something special and different is, uh, could happen very soon. Well, that's what they believe. Uh, you, you, most of you probably know that Volvad is dominance in queries, uh, novel and, and uh, movie. Well, the answer here is Volvad is homine. What is the future? A lot of people believe that this is the future, and everybody talks about we are worried that the machines or a combination of humans, machines, or something else are going to take over. And uh, as I said, this is the hype, and we're going to spend some time to see how much of this is realistic or not. But that is what I believe is going to happen. <clears throat> so this, let's start with the technical background for the artificial intelligence. Uh, if you look around, it's amazing that how many applications of artificial intelligence are around, almost in everything. Here is, here is an example. Um, you're going to see how many of those are packed here. But in general, uh, they are penetrating every aspect of our lives. Uh, and also, some, sometimes they are not recognized as artificial intelligence applications, but they are. And uh, it generated such an interest everywhere. There is a tremendous amount of money invested in artificial intelligence. There are startups companies, big companies. Everybody and his brother uh, is putting money in. And these are some of the applications. <laughs> Almost everywhere, robots, medicine, space exploration, uh, financial fraud detection, marketing algorithms. Uh, here is some example. Usually, when I say that there are robots, people imagine these assembly lines where they have these uh, robots kind of uh, arms uh, doing assembly. That's, this is 20, 30 years ago. These robots uh, right now are extraordinarily varied e everywhere. For instance, in Japan, Japan is a country, is the first country in the world where uh, there are more uh, old people than young people. In Japan, they, they don't have much of a reproduction rate, and they're very worried that people are going to get uh, old, and there is nobody to, to stay with them. And uh, it's the first country who spent a lot of money in a different, in investing in a different kind of robot, like home assistants, like this uh, cuddly, nice uh, robots which are going to help people li as being like pets or like being like the nephews and the grandsons they didn't have because they are not, there are too many, too many grandfathers and grandmothers, not enough kids. So it's a problem for them. Also, in Japan also, there is something else. They are very advanced in robotics. Uh, you probably remember a few years back was this uh, catastrophic event, a huge uh, earthquake with a tsunami, and the, one of the, their uh, uh, nuclear power plants was c c totally destroyed. And the uh, radiation intention was, uh, intensity was so high that no humans could go there. They had specially designed robots which went and they stopped uh, the valves and did, or did all kinds of work which otherwise would not have been possible. <coughs> Military. I don't want to spend too much time on that because it's scary. Uh, in the United States, there is an agency called DARPA, which is the um, uh, investment arm of Pentagon. And they spend billions and billions of, uh, of dollars on artificial intelligence in all aspects. Some of them are known. Some of them are secret. But uh, it's, it's almost everything. Um, look at that. To replace the soldiers, these are when you see this, this is not like uh, something with remote control, which you, uh, they send on the, uh, to, to, to fight. No, these are programmed artificial intelligence. They go, and depending on the conditions, they start shooting without any control. Nobody controls them. It's, it's scary. Uh, drones, uh, robots to, to support the troops, and so on and so forth. So it's a huge amount, and I don't want to spend too much time on that because uh, you, know, you, you don't sleep at night, probably being worried. And you probably know about that. A few years back, Kasparov, who was at that time the, the world champion in chess, uh, you know, uh, uh, played against IBM Watson. And uh, he lost. He doesn't look very happy there, by the way. But uh, <clears throat> yes, there are part of artificial intelligence. And since then, there are even more uh, more advances. Commercial applications, as I said, these are, it's a list of a, a number of them, and a good portion of them are in, the, in our smartphones. 
I mean, uh, you know, you've noticed when you, you speak into the phone and you know, starts uh, typing, this is an artificial intelligence. There are uh, uh, face recognition, image recognition, uh, chess playing, uh, predictions, and so on and so forth, almost everywhere. The interesting part and the important part for our discussion is that all these applications which I mentioned so far are something which is called artificial narrow or artificial uh, specialized applications. And this is as opposed to AGI, artificial general intelligence. What, the, what the, that's a very important distinction because as you've noticed, this, all these applications are trying to solve a specific problem, challenging, typical of artificial intelligence, but they are specialized. Now, the, the holy grail of uh, researchers in the field is to obtain artificial intelligence, which is like, like the human brain, can do everything. Up to this point, most of the artificial intelligence are very good in things which, where the brain is, it doesn't have such a, a good chance because we, you know, the brain, we don't have the capabilities to, to move, to calculate so fast. But they're not so good that common sense will, will, will uh, cover uh, later on why. So this is important because the holy grail, they want to get here. And there are different things, and you will see later on, and people get a little bit more optimistic or pessimistic about achieving artificial general intelligence. Anyhow, so a little bit of history. How did artificial intelligence start? Well, it started, it's, it's a young science, by the way. It's not an old science. It uh, started basically at the end of the Second World War, and it's uh, associated with the invention of electronic uh, digital computer. Not the computing machine. There are lots of computing machines over the years were, but electronic digital computer, you know, with vacuum tubes and the Colossus in UK and ENIAC United States. Um, they are kind of cre uh, created, you know, vacuum tubes in order to be able to uh, do number crunching, calculations. That's, that was the goal of the computers. Why that? Because uh, oh, by the way, uh, before we go on, uh, I want to mention Alan Turing and John von Neumann are some of the names of the people who were essential in uh, creating these computers. Alan Turing was a, probably you are familiar with, uh, a, a British uh, scientist who was very important uh, because he was a key contributor to the deciphering enigma, which was the, the cipher for the German troops. Uh, that was a pretty important thing which helped in, uh, in uh, the, the Allies winning the Second World War. John von Neumann it's an was an American scientist of Hungarian origin who was a genius in, in many fields, including designing computers, quantum mechanics, and, and many other things. Um, so this is an interesting thing. Because I want to get to artificial intelligence, and we start with something which had nothing to do with artificial intelligence. Started with number crunching. Well, how do we go from number crunching to cognitive functions? Initially, the computer was, as I said, it was designed to perform scientific calculation, number crunching, uh, di differential equations, and so on and so forth, because they are very good at that. And people noticed also, and this is an interesting thing, Notice that the computer can be used also to process, manipulate some symbols from a list using mathematical logic, using syllogisms. Now, syllogisms are not a new science. They are coming from Aristotle. They are only 2,500 years old. But the syllogism, it's, it's a typical thing because Aristotle invented the, the logic. And it was perfected lately in mathematical logic. And it's a typical thing, like his premises and the conclusion. You know, like most of the philosophical books, they, they use this one. Pre major premise, all uh, men are mortal. Uh, the minor premise is Socrates, it's a man. And then the conclusion is Socrates is mortal. So the idea is that you get new valid results logically if you apply formal rules to a set of premises. Oh, bingo, that's what they said. If the computer now, instead of giving them nim uh, numbers, we give them symbols from a list. The, the symbol would be Socrates, a man, and so on and so forth. And then you define very well and you know, precise this uh, logical, mathematical logic rules. You get a formal system where the computer exercising it 
it's, uh, it's going to be able to get valid, new valid results without anybody's intervention. But I want to make sure it, the computer does not understand the meaning of these symbols. You've noticed there are symbols placed in. There are logic rules placed in by people, by humans. And the computer gets new value results, and they're logic machines. Now, Alan Turing, again, and John McCarthy, one of the, the founders of artificial intelligence, they notice that the computer can perform cognitive activities, because out of this logic machinery comes something new. And said, oh, that's what the brain does, too. And they extrapolated this to and saying, ah, the brain also must be acting as a computer. It's an algorithm. So the brain takes algorithms and calculates all kinds of things and does all the cognitive functions using this algorithm. This is called, the name for that is computationally. There are many names for that, symbolic uh, uh, representation, uh, computationally. <coughs> And this, this, I want to make sure, this is an assumption. It's not clear that the brain is absolutely algorithmic. But it was an assumption. And when they started that in the late 40s and the 50s, they became so excited. They said, this is it. The brain is a computer. We know how to do it. The computer is going to be like a brain, so a kind of equivalence. So the next step said extrapolate the fact that computer can be used similarly to the brain for cognitive function. And that's how John McCarthy came up and said, oh, this is then whatever we do on the computer, it's artificial intelligence. It's, it's kind of a misnomer, but that's, how, that's the, the, the story. OK, so a little bit of history. It's interesting. It was an extraordinary enthusiast at the beginning. They had 20 years. They are even called the golden years of the, um, the artificial intelligence. These are some of the founders, by the way. These are very big names. John McCarthy, it was at Dartmouth University, Marvin Minsky, Alan Newell and Herman Simon, um, uh, Arthur Samuels, IBM. So these people, it was such an effervescent, effervescent uh, period. They were c coming up with ideas from everywhere. It, it was such an extraordinary new things coming. It was excitement. And they have a lot of interesting things. They solve logical problems. They prove theorems. Um, in fact, Newell and Simon had uh, one program who did prove some of the theorems from Bertrand Russell's uh, uh, book. Um, they had early translation tools, game playing. Uh, Arthur Samuel did it, expert systems. And because of this remarkable enthusiasm, and they showed some, some of these applications. Uh, People become excited. And the government said, oh, there is something here. And they were able to get a lot of significant funding from both US and the UK government. That was, they were the golden years. But also, now we have to be careful. This is it's a theme of my presentation, hype. Uh, there is something with humans. Very smart people, they, they can't resist hype. These are very smart people, these founders. But look at the kind of optimistic claims they made about the future of AI. Simon, and by the way, Simon, Herbert Simon, not only was involved in being one of the founders of artificial intelligence, later on he got a Nobel Prize for economics. I mean, these are you know, pretty, pretty heavy, heavy uh, level intellectual people. But he, they were so enthusiastic themselves, they said machines will be capable within 20 years, nine, that was 1965, of doing whatever um, um, work uh, any man can do that. In other words, we will get to the level of computers being like humans in 1965. In 1970, Marvin Minsky, in from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Well, we are almost 40 years later. We're so far from that. But the hype was hype and convinced a lot of people. They were convinced themselves about the assumptions I got some results. However, uh, when you hype too much and you don't deliver too much, then deflates. So that's what happened. It's called the, uh, this period is called AI winter, artificial intelligence winter. Why? It, it lasted about, about 20 years, a little bit less. The bubble of enthusiasm deflated. Now, there are a number of issues here. One, limited computer power. Now, if you if you look at the computers we have right now, 
the desktop, they are significantly more powerful than the, the big machines, the super machines that they had in the 60s and 70s. So clearly, it was something with the hardware. At that time, it was not good enough. Uh, but also, their approaches, the common sense knowledge and reasoning didn't work out. These logic systems, we'll descri describe them later on, they are not amenable to, to the common sense. This rule-based system governed by mathematical logic are too complex, hard to maintain, they are too rigid, and they don't, uh, 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 they're hard to maintain because rules, they always have exceptions, and then you have to go and put uh, more rules for the exception, and so on and so forth, so it's, it's really a nightmare. Um, and also, they don't have any ability to handle uncertainty. Logic is zero or one, yes or no. It's uh, uh, modus ponens, it's either or, you know, and so on and so forth. So, they didn't have ability to introduce probabilistic approach. And nature is probabilistic. It's, uh, so, um, so, leaving that aside, there are philosophical issues which they made assumptions, and by the way, I want to make this statement right now, even today. Most of the people who are working in computer science, uh, and there is something which is uh, my preoccupation, because the, the courses I'm teaching are, are trying to, to go between uh, technology and a little bit of philosophy, because something happened in the, everywhere in the world. Everybody has curriculum. It's so busy that if you do computer science or electrical engineering, you don't do any history or science or philosophy or anything else. And the same is true for people in the humanistic department. They don't have any, any background in, in technical. And that's not good because there are, especially in artificial intelligence, there are so many philosophical assumptions which are taken for granted. And nobody tells students about that. And they keep going. And you will see many of those. From a philosophical point of view, it's very dangerous, and we'll see why. Uh, so as I said, some philosophers had strong objections within universities, say, hey, what are you guys doing? There is a famous um, uh, philosopher in the um, United States, uh, Hubert Dreyfus. He died a few years ago, who was told all these luminaries, you know, McCarthy and uh, Marvin Minsky and all these guys, this is not the right thing for what you are trying to do to achieve, uh, to achieve intelligence like a human. Yeah, you are doing some applications, but not like a human, because philosophically, it's not, your philosophical assumptions are not correct. And they got mad. They were so cocky. They said, no, they, they wouldn't allow him to come to the, to the uh, very smart people could be very nasty sometimes. So that, that's a different story. But anyhow, so they, they fought for that. The point is that uh, he was right. Um, and uh, that was not the, the right way to go for artificial general intelligence. Anyhow, so the bottom line is the, the funding kind of ended. It was pretty doom and gloom. It was not good. And then a miracle happened. <laughs> uh, so what was the miracle? Kind of a miracle. Something completely different came out of nowhere. And that happened in the, around at the beginning of the 90s. Now, why? A significant revival of artificial intelligence. So it's what, 20, 20 something years, uh, almost 30 years. So there are a number of developments, not only one, a number of them. Uh, so here is what's happening. Major progress in hardware, major, huge progress. Now, most of this progress is coming due to something which is called, and we're going to cover later on, uh, Moore's Law. I uh, don't know if you heard, Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel. And he came up with this law, said, uh, and that was in the 70s. Uh, he said, we will be able, looking at the developments and all the technology, we'll be able to push more transistors per unit volume to double them every 18 months. That was pretty radical in that time. But what does it do? If you are able to do that, this is humongous because the, the, the computing power grows tremendously. And also, the power goes down because you have low, smaller distances and so on and so forth. The number of cycles goes up. The same thing happened in storage, in, in uh, uh, computing, and network bandwidth. So a lot of the hardware was developed. Why? Because it was a confluence of technologies. In order to do that in, in silicon, you need to have 
um, a lot of software which was developed for uh, CAD CAM machines in order to be able to place this, the, the so-called pacers, uh, very s uh, sophisticated uh, methodology in order to do this uh, integrated circuits in, in high volume. A lot, a lot of progress, but it helped with eventually the, the storage, uh, computing, and so on and so forth. They all became faster, better, and uh, cheaper. And definitely the internet. The moment the internet came, it was another explosion. The users and, and uh, tremendous, tremendous advantage. So those were some of the things. However, that's not, not what the miracle, I mean, it was a miracle in itself, but you know, but something specific for AI was the fact that they were successful at creating fundamentally new approaches and strategy in software development, in calculations. Why? Well, first of all, they were too cocky before. They became a little bit more humble, said maybe, you know, all this logic stuff, you know, maybe we should look at how the brain actually does. So they started looking at, oh, there are neurons and they connect this and they do that. And so they, they started looking at the brain functionality and that's how the neural networks which is a major uh, branch right now, uh, was developed. Also, they looked at how nature does, because, you know, supposedly we are, we humans are now intelligent after so many billions of years of evolution, because evolution did something. So people developed, started developing the so-called evolutionary algorithms, very, very sophisticated, very interesting. But also, and that was a major, major, and it still is one of the most important, significant things which happened in the last 25 years. The ability to bring uncertainty into the artificial intelligence software. Statistical nature of reality needs a way to be modeled because that's what uh, nature is. Nature is not uh, rigid logic. And because of that, a lot of new techniques were developed which very solid mathematically, very useful. And something else happened. Before, you see, there is a big difference. This is a huge paradigm shift, emphasizing the, the, the elevated role of data. And all these are under the name of machine learning te technology. So, as I said, it is a, a, a paradigm shift. Why is that? Because if you look at how they used to do artificial intelligence before was logic rules. So you take a computer uh, uh, subject matter expert in a field, medical field or whatever else, who knows how things go. And you put a computer scientist close and they start talking about and they eventually put the rules together, they develop a program, and then they generate some data. Bingo, this is completely reversed because of the internet and because of all the hardware we see cheap and everybody's generating data at, at, at an enormous rate, data is available in everything, and the data is cheap. Subject matter experiments are expensive, uh, and you know, there are not too many. And this is the miracle of the machine learning. They take the data, they find patterns, and they develop the program which is kind of de generating the pattern of data. This is the very nice. The, the point I'm trying to make is that this is not like a miracle in, in the supernatural way. It's a miracle in terms of what they were able to do and is backed up by significant, solid theoretical, mathematical, theoretical, uh, everything. It's, you know, I mean, these are serious algorithms. These are not kind of guessing things. And you have machine learning then uh, with key branch. We don't have time for that. There are courses of that. People spend a lot of time. Some people call this. Uh, not machine learning, you I might, uh, in some industries called big data or pattern recognition, but it's the same thing basically. There are a number of algorithms like uh, supervised learning in classification, unsupervised in clustering, linear regression prediction, you know, doing, and reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is very important because it's similar to what, uh, closer to what humans are doing. They're exploring and, and, and are learning the environment and then trying to improve. Anyhow, so it turned out that in the last 20 years, there are extraordinary uh, important results in face, uh, using machine learning algorithms. Face recognition, character recognition, speech recognition, medical diagnostics. And why that? Here are summary of advantages of this statistical machine learning. What? They are able to learn general models from particular examples. Data is cheap and abundant because of the internet. 
while well, knowledge is rare and expensive, and it is using layers of neuro neural networks similar to the brain. So all this confluence of things created some remarkable results. What did this do? Here it is, interesting. Uh, I don't know if you heard of DeepMind. DeepMind, it's a company, it's a British company who was founded in 2010 and acquired by Google in 2014. And they, they have an army of PhDs, I mean, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds, uh, very top level people from top level universities. They were able to demonstrate great successes. They developed this deep learning algorithms in which they were able to take some of the Atari video games, which were you know, designed before, but the machine itself was able to learn itself and improve by playing against itself in such a way that they got in some of the games, uh, they got to the level of better than any humans. And in fact, they, they even claimed that it was kind of a superhuman because they, uh, one of the machines was able to find a way and in, in break out the game to go from, from, from the back, which even the designers of the game did not imagine that. So it's, it's kind of amazing what we're able to do. The machines, this was no human intervention. I mean, they gave the rules, and the machine kept playing and improving uh, whatever they were doing, and really got extraordinary results. Uh, and also, uh, that was another thing a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, you probably, I don't know, you, you read in the papers. It was kind of touted like a great success. The success was they, 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 these machines, they played against the world champions of Go. Go is a you know, Chinese game which is significantly more complex than, than chess. It's still a finite game, but it's significantly more complex and more difficult to do. And they were able to win. And uh, you know, that was, again, uh, touted as, as a very, very uh, big thing. So now, so you've noticed we are going to shift a little bit the, the, so this is what actually happened. But now, you see, people start interpreting. All this, as I said, it appears like a miracle, and it appears like they are doing so well that people said, oh, we can get very close to artificial general intelligence, which was the holy grail. And, uh, uh, and by the way, the deep mind people kind of entertain that, you know, yes, sure, we're doing so great. Well, you see what ramifications they have. People, you know, have to be careful. Uh, so belief that human-like intelligence in machine can be achieved, combined with the hype of early AI researchers, brought even more credence to the transhumanist movement. What is, now we go to the second part. What is transhumanism and singularity? Well, this is interesting. Trans By the way, it's a huge movement. I, I'm teaching at Georgetown a, a class about that. So that, that's a, it's a long class. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to put that in a few slides, something which, it's a huge amount of literature. There are, there are uh, internet presence, there are books, there are, people are really getting into it. Why? This is interesting. It's something in us, humans. Let's see. What is it? It's a powerful intellectual and social movement. It exudes great techno-utopianist optimism that technology will solve all our problems. Uh, the, they believe, why? Because they believe it's a conflict, it's a convergence of technologies, computer, artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology, and genetics, and will create a new bright future of the make, uh, mankind. Why? Because they can solve so many problems, not only economic problems, but cure diseases for a long life, maybe indefinitely, and you will see how. We'll, we'll talk about that. This is, this is something with religious overtones. Uh, also, will enhance human cap capabilities in all directions, physical, sensorial, cognitive, and so on and so forth. And these are some of the names. They, they are the, the apostles of uh, transhumanism. Uh, Max Moore, Ray Kurzweil, Hans Moravec, and others. So let me, let me make a, a, a quick detour. When we talk about transhumanism now, you've noticed it's connected with artificial intelligence and other technological developments. But the idea of transhumanism in, uh, for humans, it's not new. It's very old. It's probably from the beginning of civilizations. There is something with humans that are not satisfied to according to their nature. You know, if you look at other species, you know, fish swim, birds fly. Humans want to do all, all of this and even more. There is something in humans uh, to be like gods. 
and uh, what is Sotiris here? The Greek mythology, he knows, hubris, foolish pride challenging the gods, Prometheus, Daedalus and Icarus. Remember what Daedalus, you know, he built the, uh, the palace for the Minotaur, and then the, the king said, no, you can't, you can't leave the island of Crete. And then started doing this and put some wings and flew. Well, Icarus was a little bit too much, went too far. You, you know what happened. The gods punishes them, but they are transhuman. They, wanna, they always wanted to be transhumans. Prometheus, the same thing. And uh, there is something with us, with humans. Look at that. If you fast forward a few centuries back, millennia in fact, Humans in the 18th and 19th, uh, 19th century, they invented science, starting with the 13th century, and then developed the Industrial Revolution, and augmented human power. You see, that's what it was a transhumanist idea, to do more than what uh, the, the humans or the oxen do. And they invented uh, you know, steam machines, combustion engines, electrical motors. And guess what? They still don't stop. They challenged God. They invented the nuclear fission atomic bomb. And so far, we haven't been punished yet. But you never know. We are very close to. So it's, uh, humans are pushing always, uh, challenging the gods. OK, there is hubris here. And now, this is the next phase in information. We are now in the information revolution. What humans want to do, the invention of digital computer and artificial intelligence, they want to challenge the gods again and create artificial super intelligence, which we are going to define later on in a few slides down what that means and why they believe they can do it. And achieve immortality by uploading our minds, our personalities, ourselves in silicon. That's their idea of achieving immortality. We, they hate, the transhumanists hate the body. They want to get rid of the body. They say, body, it's the... It's the source of everything which is wrong, because you get old, you, it's sick, and so on and so forth. We want to get rid of that. We want to take our personality, put it on silicon, and go conquer the universe and, and live forever. Whereas gods, and we might as well get good at it, one of them said. So you notice that hubris says significant components of hype, boasting, bragging, and cockiness. So now part of the transhumanists they developed this concept, which is very much talked about. And you'll see a lot of people took that from the transhumanists. Uh, the singularity. What is the singularity? This is a very interesting concept. Uh, it's based on the hypothetical advent of artificial general intelligence. As I said, with all the extraordinary applications I showed before, they are only what's called narrow or specialized. We still have not achieved artificial general intelligence. But all the new recent developments and machine learning and others say, we are very close. We are so close. And now people said, assuming we are going to achieve that because we are so close, what this is going to happen? Here is an interesting, let, let get with their train of thought here. Here is what's happening. We have to acknowledge that what AGI means is that a computer once you achieve AGI, would be able to design other computers similar but improved a little bit because it's like humans. We humans design computers, let's say, new generations every 10 years. Now it's faster, every five years. I believe now it's around two, two years and something. So if they have the same in intelligence like we do, they will be able to do that, to generate new, better computers. But, and this is a key, Look at their resources, a computer resource, and ours. What's happening in our brain? The new, uh, neurons, you know the speed of neurons? Milliseconds. Do you know the speed of what's happening? With Nanoseconds. It's millions of times, billions of times faster. Memory. How much memory we have? You know, have some memory. But look at the extraordinary amount of gigabytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, exabytes, petabytes, and so on and so forth. They are enormous uh, resources. So from this point of view, imagine that the computers having all these resources, it means I can do much faster whatever we humans are doing. They have the same capability. So the recursive thing of designing new computers and better, even if they are not significantly better immediately, but there are so many cycles they can go through because of the resources. 
that eventually this super intelligence is getting more and more intelligent, more intelligent, until they get to the point, you know, that it's an intelligent explosion or smart machines designed successful generations to the level and get to the level that far su uh, surpasses humans. That's called singularity. Comes from mathematics. You have a singularity goes something toward the infinity. You don't know what's happening there. It's, it's like a huge, uh, huge change. Okay, so. Uh, we need to come back to that because this is an important uh, thing. You've noticed there are so many assumptions behind that, but that's how they think, and they write books about that. But before we do it, I would like to just talk a, a little bit about the following thing. When you hear about what this singularitarians and transhumanists in general uh, claim as uh, their goals, they're not timid, they're radical goals. And you would, you would kind of think, say, listen, uh, this is science fiction. There are a lot of science fiction, by the way, good, which talks about that. But they say, no, it's not. And one of them, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is one of the major lobbyists, you know, is, is a promoter in that. He works for Google now. He, he wrote a lot of books. But this is important to mention because they are not, these are not stupid people. They are very smart technological people. They are just very daring. They are very, they, they, they jump the gun very quickly, but they are very smart people. Here is what he says. Um, he wrote a book, Singularity is Near. And he says, we have technological reasons to believe that this can be achieved. What are the technological reasons? We believe that the progress could happen very fast because look at what happened in the history. How did the humans become intelligent? Because of evolution. Evolution, things happen. Humans did not exist four billion years ago. You know, the, the initially reptiles and slowly evolution created progress and more intelligence. And because he is convinced that the nature, the evolution created something which he says, law of accelerated returns. And I, I showed you this example of uh, Gordon Moore's uh, law. Why? Why is evolution creating this progress? He says, but if you look at what evolution does, he says, imagine this, there is something, you take the best, because that, that evolution has, the other ones, they don't have uh, children. The best, and then among the best, again, you take the best, and so on and so forth. So taking the best of the best is equivalent to his, what's called exponential growth, you know, like, like the compound uh, capital in, in, a, in, a check, in a savings account. And indeed, that uh, the exponential evolution goes extraordinarily fast. And uh, he knows that you can't have uh, evo uh, exponential uh, growth for everything forever because this requires infinite resources. But what he says is, it's, if you look at that, it's a, um, it's a paradigm shift. Let me, it's, this is an interesting thing. He, he, he's a smart guy. He said, look at what happened, for instance, that we were able to, when we started with computers after the Second World War with vacuum tubes. You know, vacuum tubes are like this for one function. So a computer was like this room with very, very few capabilities. But now look at what we have. But this did not happen in one, with one paradigm. The progress existed because after the human, the vacuum tubes came, what? Transistors. So the transistors, you put them on a PC board and significantly less, less power. But then, so you've noticed it's a paradigm shift from vacuum to transistors. And then there is another. So you say, OK, now how much more can you get out of transistors? Well, but then a new paradigm was invented. And that's his point. People are, are imaginative and creative. Invented integrated circuits. And then in the integrated circuits, you do more and more. There are paradigm shifts in the way they, they put transistors closer and closer. So, but this overall, if you look at that, is like an exponential growth. So that, in his point, this is the law of accelerated returns. And he says that's happening everywhere. And uh, yeah, that happened in the uh, biological uh, uh, evolution. And technology evolution is another of these, uh, uh, you know, examples. So, so bingo, they believe it can be done. But there is technology background can be done. And what can we solve with that? And by the way, I don't have time in this presentation, but it is an equivalent thing talking about the uh, progress in genetics and nanotechnology. Huge fields, but they combine. The transhumans are combining from all three. But it's just too much, so I, I wanted to stay focused. So what can they do? Well, as I said, 
solve old issues, you know, with, with mm -hmm. genetics. Lifespan extension, because uh, I said before, maybe indefinitely, master genetics achieve desired properties with designer babies. Uh, achieve super intelligence, eventually generate this new race of post humans. So, this is interesting. So, someone can come and say, listen, guys, I mean, yeah, this, is, this is not so easy to do. You know, you, you, you claim you can do that, but you know, maybe, maybe it's going to be delayed. Maybe it's not so near. Say, time out. We have a backup plan. Even if this algorithmic thing doesn't work, we have a backup plan. Now, be prepared to be impressed a little bit with what they have in mind. This is called whole brain emulation. The goal of this is to transfer your personality in the computer. And uh, before you do that, because a little bit, you, you, is not, some people don't feel so good about that because it's destructive now. But there is technology, nanotechnology, which they claim that eventually could become non-destructive. But leaving that aside, let's see what, what they propose right now. And the important part is, and this is always what Kurzweil comes back and says, all the techniques I'm going to describe now how to do that, all these techniques exist already. They are not at the level to do that, but they exist. This is the point. So here is what they call, uh, what is the whole brain emulation? So it's based on the assumption that the brain and the mind is the same. And if you are able to find the brain connections, neurons, and all the connections, and transplant that in silicon into a computer, it should be like the brain functionality. So they say, you take your brain, prepare a little bit, and then you come with a machine which exists now. It, it cut a very thin slice. It has to be thin because it has to be transparent. So you see the neurons and connections. And you put it under an electronic microscope. And by the way, this technology exists. You, you, people do that, electron tomography. So you, you do that. And bingo, you get in software the connection of electrons. But this is in two dimensional only. So and then you tie, you go to the brain and cut another slice very close to, the, to this one and do the same thing. And being so close, after you have all these 2D slices, there is a, a software right now which can take this and constructs a 3D complete connectivity of the brain. All the neurons with all the connections. And they say, if we have that, this is your brain on the computer. We turn the switch on and say, hello. Now, before you submit yourself to that, maybe you have wait a little bit <laughs> for the next slides. But that's what they say. Well. Listen, I, 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 I want to make, make sure uh, I do not want to hype anything, but I do not want to criticize. These are very smart people. I, my goal tonight is to show different points of view. And you will see that we all have to uh, use critical thinking because nobody is going to, you can't believe only one person. They all have something to, to sell. OK, so, um, so. These are the key questions now. So we have a little bit of background now. We talked about that. So we should try to answer these questions. Uh, are the scientific and technological developments supporting the radical predictions of transhumanism and singularity? That's a fair question. And also, the hypothetical advent of singularity is also based on some philosophical assumptions. I mentioned some of them, but you will see uh, I'm going to be much more explicit in the few, next few slides. But the question is. Are these philosophical assumptions supporting these claims? And finally, are artificial intelligence and singularity existential threats to humanity? That's what we need to answer. We have a background. Now we can go and analyze that. So now you've noticed it's, you know, it's the, the white hat, black hat. I, I used to have the white hat. I let all these people to tell how they are going to do it. Didn't challenge them. Now we're going to come and try to challenge them a little bit and say, hold on a second. Comb a little bit with a fine comb. So you said, Mr. Kurtzel, you said singularity is it's, uh, it's near because you saw the law of accelerated returns. But if you look at that, these are, these are not f f nature, physical laws, like gravity or like the uh, chemical combination of molecules. These are uh, assertions about how past rates of scientific and technical progress can predict the future. Therefore, like other attempts to forecast the future from the past, they work until they don't. These are the kind of laws like that in social sciences. And uh, now you are young here, but I grew up in this country and we studied Marxism. 
there were laws. There were pretty clearly historical laws when we knew exactly what was going to happen. So you have to be a little bit careful when the laws are not exactly the laws of nature. So, <clears throat> but also, so leaving aside this point, there is another very important point. I, I, you notice how much, I, I said how much progress was made in hardware. Well, and people here who are designing software, they know that the progress in software was not of the same nature. In other words, the more hardware, the faster you have, the more software you add. It looks like the software is getting slower somehow. There is no breakthrough in the law of accelerated returns in designing software. And there are a, a number of good reasons. You know, you have to support existing things, and you can't start from scratch. I mean, I'm not going to go into that. But it's very, very difficult. Besides, there are a number of things inherent in software which doesn't seem like they have the same exponential progress like the hardware. So you have to be careful with that. And also, I want to tell you now, uh, let puncture a little bit their whole brain emulation thing. Because that, that sounds like a good, leaving aside the philosophical assumption, which I'm going to go later on to. But when they said, let's get this connecticum of all the uh, uh, neurons in the brain, put them in, and put them in the computer. OK. So there is this little worm, few millimeters. It's called Chenoharbidis elegans, C. elegans, translucid, C. elegans. And about 20, uh, mid-80s, mid-1980s, People, uh, the, the, the extraordinary important thing for researchers was that this worm has 102 neurons. Uh, that's it. So he said, that must be easy for us to understand the connections between them and exactly understand the brain complexity of the C elegance. And they started in the 80s, it took 20 years. You won't believe. It was a huge progress, 20 years. They did. They got complete connecticum of, of uh, C. elegans, and they did that. And now there is a major project, which was started four or five years ago, to actually simulate the brain of C. elegans with 102 neurons. And now they had, uh, last year they presented, they used this, uh, a supercomputer with 20 megawatts of power to say five seconds of the functionality of C. elegans. Now, uh, I would be a little bit more humble saying that the brain has 100 billions of these neurons the, uh, about uh, whole brain emulation being such a, such a sure thing. So I'm, I'm saying we don't know much about the brain. There are major progresses, but there is such a complex thing that I would be a little bit reluctant to believe that the whole brain emulation could work like this because the technologies exist. OK, so now we got to a point. Very interesting point. There are some philosophical assumptions which, as I said, there is a big problem with people in the technical uh, world. They, they don't, they take for granted a number of them. Uh, and then I'm going to go only, only three of them, but they're pretty major. One is called computational theorem of mind. The second is uh, uh, Searle's uh, argument against computer understanding. John Searle is a philosopher at the uh, United States at the Berkeley University. And uh, then is the something which is called the disembodied, the Cartesian dualism. What is the CTM? Well, the CTM, is, this is the, the theorem of uh, Turing and uh, um, computational theory, theorem of mind, which says, I said at the beginning, the brain is algorithmic, and exactly like the computer. Well, a lot of people are challenged with that. The brain is not algorithmic. There are. Uh, Lucas is an uh, English philosopher. Penrose is an uh, English uh, scientist. Uh, they, they could, no, the human mind is not like a computer. It's working differently. It's not based on algorithms. Some things appear to be like algorithms, but basically it's not. And there is another, this is a pretty sophisticated mathematical thing, Gödel incomplete theorem. Uh, they are arguing much about that, but this is another reason to say that human mind is not like a computer. And then there are examples of non-algorithmic processes in the brain. You know, people say that you calculate and do this is like an algorithm. But we have so many other things in the brain. Qualia, you know, the feeling, the subjective feeling of, you know, what is the red color? Well, the red color, if you talk to somebody in physics, says, oh, this is a radiation electromagnetic spectrum of 620 nanometers. Well, that's not how we perceive it. Qualia is a subjective aspect. What means? Worms, what means color. 
it's qualia, the subjective aspect. What's consciousness? These are not algorithmic things. These are, nobody knows exactly what they are. Nobody knows. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if the CTM does not hold and the brain is not algorithmic, then we go back to when they claim that you achieve singularity because of the extraordinary resources of the computers. Well, but running that faster, even if you have the resources, if it's not algorithmic, how do you know you are going to achieve superintelligence? You may not achieve anything. You don't know what you are doing. Just running faster doesn't mean you are going to get there. So this is one. The, the second one is a very interesting thing. Because when you claim that you are going to have um, your personality uploaded into the computer, it means that that software has to be like, like you, conscient. You understand, you understand things. Well, John Searle said, the computers do extraordinary things. You've noticed all this, but they don't understand things. And he says, why? Well, here is why. Because for understanding, you need to understand the intentionality, semantics, the meaning of things. But the computers handle the syntactic part. Syntactic means the relationship between, between the symbols, as I, I said at the beginning. And uh, say, computers handle syntactic. They do not interpret semantics. Therefore, computers are not capable of understanding. And he has, he came up with a, a, a thought example, uh, example. Philosophers call that Gedanken experiment. You start to think about that. And he was pretty clever. He said, I'm John Searle. I'm American. I know English only. I don't know Chinese. The, but imagine the Chinese room. There is a room in which I am locked in. And I have dictionaries and some computers to tell me. And I have some guys giving me some some uh, uh, papers with signs, scribbled signs in Chinese. I don't know Chinese. I take this and I start going. Oh, what I see this and do that. And uh, so I translate this based on what the uh, rules are in the dictionary. And I translate in English and I give them to other people. You say, oh, look at John Searle knows English, no, Ch no Chinese. So that's the difference between semantics and syntactic. I did only syntactic work. I have no idea about Chinese. He said, computers are in the same situation. So before you jump, say that they have understanding, you have to be careful. Don't confuse semantic and, and syntactic. And then that's a, that's a very big one. And uh, I'm going to go very quickly. But this is a huge thing which goes against uh, what that. Uh, as I said, uh, Qualitans is very nice, and uh, they, they are helping. They are very interested in that. I'm going to have a presentation in May at Qualitans, a, a, a full presentation about this disembodied artificial intelligence, which is the wrong approach, and the alternative of embodied one. I'm going to mention a few points. But this is a very subtle and very deep subject and very interesting. It's state of the art right now. So let's quickly say what that means. Right now. These people who did the singularity assumptions, they implicitly used what's called the disembodied, the Cartesian dualism. What is this Cartesian dualism? Uh, Rene Descartes, his Latin name was Cartesius, like they used to do in Middle Ages, all, the, all of them. He came up with this philosophy that bodies, humans, are composed of two kinds of things, res extensa and res cogitans in Latin, the things which are, take, that are extended in space, bodies, you know. And the rest cogitants, which are thinking, which don't take anything, any place in space. They are just like spirits. So he said, we are humans following Descartes. Cartesianism assumes that the intelligence is completely separated from the body. In fact, it's, it's a typical thing which sometimes this is called uh, the formalist approach. No, but it's called, oh, the ghost in the machine. I put that here. Uh, this is, you know, in, in, in uh, literature is, is known. Because that's kind of the idea of uh, Descartes. Like the, the body is like complete stupid, like, like a robot, like Golem, the robot. And the moment the, uh, uh, the spirit comes, the res cogitans comes, uh, you know, becomes human. Well, he had a little problem. How do they connect one another? And he talked about the pineal gland. I mean, kind of, uh, anyhow. But it caught on for hundreds of years. Now philosophers, most of them don't agree with that. But that's what the singularitarians believe. Is they believe that if I'm going to take, with whatever methods, I'm going to take personality and put it in the computer, this is implicitly using this disembodied Cartesian approach. And oh, 
let me give an example of what they want, because that's, uh, on the, so Moravec, it's another uh, the transhumanist, very famous. In one of his books, uh, Mind Children, he says, mind, it's a pattern of information housed in the brain. It's nothing else, nothing more. Further, there is nothing special about the brain that makes it a particular appropriate house for the pattern. Therefore, the brain can be replaced, so mind can be implemented in silicon. That's it. So you, you've noticed his, uh, what he says. Well, Hubert Dreyfus, as I said, it's a philosopher who criticized them from the beginning. Using, it's a, it's a big debate, philosophical, it's called the phenomenology, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, but in America they are not very appreciated. You know, this is European stuff, phenomenology, but Dreyfus came back and said, listen, there is solid thinking that cognition for humans, now we're talking about humans, forget about artificial intelligence, is not disembodied project, project. This is false. Cartesianism is false. Human intelligence is not pure algorithmic because it has to deal with the real world. It is embodied. You cannot have intelligence without the body. Why is that? That's pretty simple. People don't know about that because we grew up with the idea uh, utopianist. Utopian is kind of disembodied, you know, uh, you know, from Plato, you know, and from Thomas More and communists. They were all utopias. Oh, you just do this singing there and it's not. The, the reality is infinite. If you don't have a body to limit the infinity of reality, you cannot act. Uh, for artificial agents to be able to deal, need to be embodied. Because the finite body is extracting relevant, meaningful aspects of reality. What is reality? For instance, reality here, when I look at that, I see some people and some tables. But if somebody who is, a, 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 let's say, a quantum scientist comes and says, oh, inside of this, there are these connections at the uh, molecule level or quantum level. Which reality am I going to perceive? Depending on what? The context. So this is, this is a huge, huge thing that reality is infinite. And for bodies to, for uh, living things to, ex living uh, beings to exist, they need to find a way, the perception is how to select from reality aspects of reality which are relevant for their existence. This is a very deep thing. I, I don't have time much here, but anyhow. So we'll just to give an example. He said that you guys with that logical approach, computationalism, you are never gonna solve the problem. Why? Because imagine you have a robot. Uh, uh, this is called the, the um, meaning it's inherently dependent, context dependent. So let's say you have a robot. So for the robot, you know, the designers are putting this in the robot, and robot goes, let's say, <laughs> and leave it in the, in the world. And they have to give to the robot a model. As well, what about that doesn't know. So you go this, so you go do that. And at one point, the robot goes on a road and see an arrow. So what would, uh, that was not in the model they gave him because reality, you, you, you don't know, you can't predict everything. You know, robot, it's, it's in the world. And when he sees the arrow, the robot says, what does it mean for me? Uh, should I follow in this direction? Or maybe people in this place, they, they just go the opposite. Okay, that's one question. The second one, if I go, go straight, because the arrow is straight, I go on the road and the road does this. Should I follow the road or I should go across the fields? Or, even more fundamental, does it mean should I pay any attention to it? Or maybe this is a place where people go and tie their bikes or horses or whatever. So you see, there is no meaning if you either put in a model in the brain of the robot, or you have to go out to have embodied and explore and understand. That's what human beings and the living beings are doing. So if you can't do that, that's why they claim this is called the frame problem. And it's essentially in determining the relevance. And the reason uh, using the classical approach, it's impossible to solve this. Why? Because you can always put a model of the, of the reality, but you can't keep up with the reality is changing. It's infinite. So uh, the only way it's embodied or uh, the world is the model itself, explore it, and it's, it's a pretty deep thing and it's interesting and we'll talk about that. But that is basically, Another the philosophical assumption which the singularitarians and transhumanists, they assume without thinking through it. And based on all the things I said, my answer to that singularity near definitely not. Now, I have to be careful because if Mr. Ray Kurzweil says that, he's gonna vehemently argue with me. 
The, my, my point is, do I say that that's not, never going to happen? Well, that's debatable because of the philosophical assumption, but maybe there are ways. But clearly, what he said in his book is that it's going to happen by 2040, 45 or so. Well, looking where we are right now, we are very far. We, so uh, it's a very important point. Uh, no, don't, don't get, you know, this is clearly I, my frame. In general, when we talk about future, you know what Yogi Berra said, uh, it, it, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. So we have to be careful when we make predictions about the future. So I'm going to stay three or four decades here, not, not more. In fact, uh, very, you know, great names in artificial intelligence like Hinton and others say, you can't make any prediction more than five years. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> but uh, listen, these people are everywhere and they convince the number. We, we will see why I want to be a little bit more assertive now as opposed to saying uh, we don't know. I am absolutely convinced and you will see what the recommendation is for everybody. You can educate yourself, make a critical thing, absolutely not in the next three or four decades, which are important for us. Now, I want to make sure that uh, that doesn't mean that there are not going to be very complex systems with intelligent AI feature. Absolutely humongous. We already have complex systems like air traffic controller or, or power system. And boy, are they scary. They could really create problems when they, when they fail. So they're going to be even more complex. So, I'm not saying they cannot, because even if you uh, are not doing embodied AI, if you look th this Cartesian, uh, this embodied, it works in a formal system. That's why it works in, in video games. It works wherever the designers can predict, put very well the model together. So there are lots of applications which are going to be developed that will be very, very useful, extraordinary. I'm talking here the idea that the singularitarians who create something which is a sentient machine, something which is, has consciousness. That's what I'm saying is not going to happen. Uh, because, you know, they might create something which appears to be, you know, uh, I don't know if you know the philo the, uh, this expression. In philosophy, they call it philosophical zombies. What do they mean by that? For instance, this is, the, this is uh, one of the paradoxes of consciousness. Nobody knows if somebody else has consciousness. I know I have. You probably know, know that you have, but I don't know you have. And, and you don't know if I have. Maybe I'm a robot programmed so well for this environment that I answer and you appear, oh, this guy appears to be conscious, but might not have any feelings, might, might be a pure robot. So this is the danger. All this using what the techniques I uh, said before, they could appear to be like human beings, but they could be philosophical zombies. So that is, that's a very important thing. So uh, that, that's the point I, I was trying to make. No AI application has so far made any progress toward obtaining a sentient machine, not even one. So we need our complexity in doing these extraordinary features, but not sentient, not something which you can see it's, uh, it's like a person. Anyhow, so here is the, uh, the, the conclusion is that if we doubt that, we should place doubts on all this extrapolation of singular Italians. Man uploading super intelligence taking over, machines taking over, substrate independent intelligence, indefinite life expansion. As I said before, the embodied AI has a chance. That's the reason. It's a very interesting thing. It has a chance. And, but it's very, it's an infancy. And we don't know, and definitely not by 2040, which is only 20 years later. Uh, and it's, you know, nobody knows the, the long term. So now that brings me to the last part. I want to, two things I want to cover here. Fascination with singularity and real social problems brought by AI. So this is something which is very interesting. How do we explain this fascination with singularity, transhumanism and singularity? Well, in my opinion, it goes beyond the technical model. There are some possible explanations. Techno-utopianism is cool. I mean, look at Star Trek. Do you know there are conventions of Star Trek United States? I mean, you know, like Star Wars. This is cool stuff, especially the young people love it. So it's, they get into it. So that's one. Uh, self-interest, I told you, people who are making all these claims, they have self-interest. And uh, boy. It's good stuff. They have PhDs. They have this Bostrom, Neil Bostrom, has uh, at Oxford, P 
pure transhumanism and uh, uh, living in a simulation. This is this is this is good stuff, and uh, they get. You know, Kurzweil uh, sta uh, started uh, the Singularity University. Man, this is good. So, you know, it's, it, 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 they are lobbyists, and I understand their point of view, and that's good. They are, and they're implicitly, they're helping researchers in AI because they want to they create, this is a good, important thing. And this is very interesting. Techno-utopian religious fervor of transhumanists. This is an extraordinary thing they achieved. Okay. Is there a religion of transhumanism? So you've noticed they all talk about technology, but implicitly they are into religion. Why? This is very interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a statement about our society. It's clear that our society, starting with enlightenment, with 18th century, slowly became less and less religious. Yes, there are a number of religious people, but most of the people are not, and especially it was a competition between science and religion. And science, for good or bad reasons, and it's complicated. I have another course at Georgetown about church and science, because that's, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, most of what people talk about now, religion was, uh, church was against, uh, this it's, it's not true. But the point is that science, because it has so many successes, created so much prestige for themselves, that eliminated most of the scientists. They claim they're either atheists or agnostics. And uh, it's kind of, if you look, uh, you, you read uh, talk, Dawkins or Harris on these people, people who are religious, they, they, are not, you know, they are not too smart. That's what they are implying, which is another you know, uh, bad thing. But the point is that the society has become more and more secular. And because of that, we had at least a thousand years of Christianity. Most of the Western societies are based on Christianity. And they have a very clear understanding of what's happening. Yes, they knew what's, ha what's happening with them, what the sacred space, what, what's happening after the, the, after the soul, after they die. What, it was a complete story. Some people believed or not, but it gave a complete story. All of a sudden, the science is replacing that with what? Oh, it's all random atoms hitting one another and emergent properties. And so what's happening after I die? Nothing. You are gone. Well, a lot of people don't like it. And uh, well, because it doesn't have an answer. This is not a good answer. Because, and I'm, I'm telling you an example. It's a very interesting example. I don't know if you are familiar with a, a, a big video game called The Second Life. Second life is something which is an extraordinary experiment, a social experiment. Second life is something where you sign up. There are hundreds of thousands, maybe million, million people working there. You get an avatar, which is your uh, new personality into the game, and you can design yourself, you know, physically, <laughs> mentally, whatever you want. And people, there are people who are spending hours and hours and hours because they want to have a sacred, different place. Yeah, they're sick and tired, going to work and going home, and that's it. And then I die and nothing. So there is a need for a sacred space for a number of people, besides of the, the, you know, the, the history of Christianity. So here is an interesting point. The transhumanist feels this need and became not only a futuristic utopia, but also a techno-futuristic religion. It's a religion without supernatural. That's what they claim. They even say. This is very interesting. There is, I don't know if you are familiar <clears throat> with the eschatology. There, are, there is a doctrine in Christianity, salvation, eschatology, the doctrine of the end of the world. The idea is that you, after you die, the, the, the soul is separated from, the, from the, your body and goes in purgatory and so on and so forth and waits until the end of the world. The eschatology uh, happens. Messiah comes back again and reunification and so on and so forth. That was a very powerful doctrine. It's called apocalyptic uh, part of, uh, of the Bible. And people grew up with that many uh, uh, generations. So because there is this researcher, uh, Robert Gerasi, who uses the term apocalyptic AI. He says that's what the transhumanists are doing. They are selling implicitly an apocalyptic AI. Why? Because they define quasi-religious approach to transhumanists. 
very similar to what uh, eschatology doctrine is. Look at this. Look at the Moravic. He said, we will create a paradise for humanity in short term. We, in long term, humans will upload their minds in the machine, and they are going to live forever in silicon, not in carbon. We'll ensure, so they give new bodies, it's the machine body or whatever else, and they live. It's the reunification, eschatology, end of the world. But we do that with our supernatural. We'll ensure eternal life, conquest of the universe. We will turn into robots. It's inevitable and desirable, and this is good. So the point I'm trying to make is that's what they propose. Where is to, where are you, Michelangelo? Um, well, the point, the point I'm trying to make is that it, nobody, nobody can eliminate everything. Religion has a lot of purposes and, and, and some needs. And I understand people cobbling with this and that. But you can't completely take it away as the communists try to do. And other uh, people we and replace with a reductionist, mechanistic things of, uh, of uh, atoms and molecules hitting one another. It's just not enough. People don't. So my point is that the apocalyptic AI cannot be ignored. It already has taken root in our culture. And I'm telling you that uh, I presented before some arguments against uh, philosophical, technological. It doesn't matter. Will not stop people believing it, it's advent and exciting opportunity. So they were very clever, very clever, and this is something to be considered. And it, it's it's real, and uh, you know it's it's going to stay with us. There is something with transhumanists. They believe it's going to solve the problems which right now people don't know how to solve. So that. Where I'm changing the, the tone again. Now we're back to, we're out of the uh, f uh, technological, we're out of the philosophical. Now we need to go back to what is happening socially right now. Because this is, I'm trying to answer what is here. Like, are the existential threats to humanity? So we have to be a little bit careful and unpack this. So, uh, who is, there is a flame of hype here. Who's hyping? Who's hyping these existential threats? Who talks about that that this is existential threats? We're going to be replaced by the machines. We're going to be artificial superintelligence and so on and so forth. Well, first of all, the lobbyists, absolutely, they do that. And for good reason. I, I, I said they, they want to get money. That's good. I understand. They support some, some goals. Uh, as I said, they have many rewards. Uh, the, also, the researchers in AI, they, they are not hyping it because they know what it is, but they like it because the hype brings money in grants, and that's what they, they live for. What's not to like about it? But here is a point, and that's a very important point. And many celebrities, there are celebrities who are hyping it. Now, you probably heard of Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Elon, everybody knows the celebrities. That's the problem. Celebrities are celebrities. Um, here is what Stephen, he just died a few years back. Uh, I fear the AI may replace humans together. He was a phys physicist. He was not AI. Why, why do they people get AI? They get from Kurzweil, from Werner Vinge. Um, Elon Musk, the technology was a fundamental risk to the existence of human civilization. Bill Gates, I mean, the camp that is concerned about super intelligence, and so on, there are many of them. Um, the problem with celebrities is that you know, they are celebrities. And uh, everybody knows, and they have followers. Uh, they, uh, uh, they have followers, deserved or not, but they have followers. I'm surprised that the Kardashians didn't talk about existential threats. <laughs> well, they, uh, pretty soon they might. They've been invited to the White House. Who knows, maybe? Well, I, I didn't know that. Uh, I noticed uh, the TV here. Keeping up with Kardashians was everywhere. I said, boy, <laughs> Romania made progress. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the point. The, the, the point is, you, you might say, why are you worried about uh, celebrities hyping it? Well, there is a reason. It's detrimental. I'm, I'm going to try to qualify why. Uh, they have large audiences, and their credibility deserved or not doesn't matter, but they influence a lot, the perception of a lot of people. People you know, just read what, what Bill Gates said, and say, oh, this is terrible. So they divert the span of attention, short as it is, of us, of the public, toward irrelevant but catchy predictions. 
and they give credence to the gossipy nature of journalists. Journalists are terrible. There are journalists here. Uh, no, they are terrible because that's, their, that's, their, that's what, how they make a living. They take something and they But when you say about existential threats, you know, uh, or, or they say, we, they solve the problem of artificial general intelligence. Then I read the article and say, that's not true. Uh, and it doesn't matter. But these celebrities are reinforcing the journalist. And also, the focus on concerns of low probability events, it's defocusing from the real important issues. Uh, instead, they should take the leadership in solving the real money, real uh, complicated problem, social and political. The problem is that a lot of the celebrities, they have a lot of money. And it's only talk. They, they don't put any money into trying to do something about it. So let me see what, what they can do. But here is the point. This is an important point here for us. It is pretty clear by now that singularity and AI are not existential threats like the nuclear bombs, nuclear uh, uh, weapons, or an asteroid or something. Even a pandemic, it's, it's an existential threat if it happens. It's not controlled. So my point is, except for scholastic speculations in academia, which are good, singularity should not be a concern to the society. It's very good for these people, lobbyists and them. It's keeping, it's an intellectual development also. It's good. But not to make people scared that this is what's happening to us. It has nothing to do with that. But, and now we're moving to, we're going beyond this. Uh, uh, are taking singularity and transhumanism out. Let's talk about only artificial intelligence now. So from what I said, you might say, oh, artificial intelligence, there, there is no threat. No. Absolutely not true. The, uh, the answer to this question, but are AI applications in general threats of any kind? They most definitely are. And this is, now we're getting to the more uh, less optimistic part of the, of the talk. There should be concern because there are potential dangers in AI development. However, these threats are very similar to any radical new technology with social implications. We, be, we went through that before as a society. These threats will accentuate the existing social and political Im ten tensions, Im imbalances, and they are already in the society, like inequality, digital divide, major social realignment due to unemployment, and a huge one which is very specific to artificial intelligence, and I bet you, you are going to feel guilty yourself after you see that. Is the Orwellian, you know, remember George Orwell, 1984, you know, the big brother watching us. This is a huge threat of artificial intelligence. It's getting better and better. Here is the Orwellian technology. I don't know if you know about that. There is a, this is real. This is not potential. In China, there is an experiment. And because China usually does things at a grand scale, there are hundreds of thousands of people, a million, in this experiment. It's an experiment organized by, by the government. They have you can go and enroll in this experiment, which is called the social credit. And the Chinese spend tremendous amount of money in AI, face recognition, cameras everywhere. So if you enroll in this program, wherever you go, they watch and they know what to do. You go and you buy something at the grocery store, and you know exactly what you bought. You go to the movie, you know, they know where. You know, you meet because there are cameras everywhere. And you know, they, they watch you and they recognize you. So you get credits if you go and buy whatever is, is good. But it's good from whose point of view? From the point of view of whoever wrote the application. It's the government there. And you get, for, but if not, if you meet with a dissident or you wrote something or you get, to the, get, get a drink, something, and start blaming the government, they subtract points. And then this social credit it used for you to be judged when you ask for something, you want to buy a house, get a loan. Okay, that's, that's, that's good, good. You are not going to get a loan. You are not going to go f travel somewhere else. This is huge because knowing the Chinese, this is pretty soon is going to become millions of people, not hundreds of thousands. So you would say, well, don't be worried because uh, suppose that this is only in the non-liberal society like China. Well, I don't know if you, you heard about Snowden and Wik WikiLeaks and well, they disclosed that in the United States in the, you know, the last 10 years or so, after the 9-11, huge amounts, all the big companies, AT&T and 
They spied on everybody. In fact, maybe I should turn it off. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, they are, you know, uh, believe me, you, Google, Google knows everything which you are doing. Uh, and you, you can't hide. And now they, everybody has emails there. What's going to happen with that? Theoretically, you know what Google said, don't do evil things. Uh, Facebook is accused of doing evil things. I'm telling you, this is a huge problem. I believe it's one of the biggest problems, which is going to affect us quickly. Because look at this. It's a huge dilemma, privacy versus security. Trends from our reaction to social media use that we are willing to surrender privacy for convenience. And you can't say no, because we all do that. What that's going to do to society, I don't know. Next, these are more difficult things which are going to happen. Threats of AI. The biggest threat I see is uh, for the next, this is for the next three or four decades. Uh, oh, no, uh, this is um, just a comment. Uh, as I said, these are similar threats to when we change from one so, uh, 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 type of society to another one. So, and you can ask, when we move from agricultural society to industrial, yes, there are some problems in the society, but we solve them. So now it's going to be the same thing. Yes, it will be, but I'm saying there are qualitative differences which I believe that society is not prepared for them. What? Well, here it is. It's, gonna, it's a huge increase of productivity. AI has a huge increase, and nobody can stop that, because that's what AI does, and does it very well. Le leaving aside everything which I said, I forgot to mention, you know the 3D printer? You know the 3D printer? You can, you can build home for you most of the clothes and most of whatever you want. Imagine what's going to happen with, with all the factories. I, I'm saying that if there is one thing which AI knows how to do is to increase productivity everywhere. Before it was only replacing people on the assembly line. No, no, no. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Some of the most threat, threatened uh, professions are the ones which can be defined. Uh, like uh, here, is, here is an example. Uh, in in United States, it's a, it's a huge legalistic society. Everybody's suing everybody else. It's an army of lawyers and an army of people to, to prepare and help them. So there is horrible technique. Uh, they, they, when you do, they, they sue you. Do the, it's called the discovery. So the discovery means they're going to ask all the documents possible. That you, you represent companies. Be careful not to be sued in the United States, because everything which happened every year, they're going to get all this huge document of everything, depose everybody. And there is an army, uh, used to be, an army of the so-called paralegals, not the lawyers. They are helping the, the lawyers. So paralegals, what they do? They go and prepare with discovery. They go and find out. Oh, so we need to look. This guy said this. Let's see, can you find in these documents this and that and that? There were people who made pretty good money, lots of them. Well, this is, is going to disappear completely in maybe in 10 years. This is a typical thing. You know, it's everything is electronic and AI application is done. The same thing could be with the truck drivers. Uh, you know, self driving cars, maybe they're not going to be for us, everybody, but truck drivers, which make very big money in the United States, and they go on specific things, self-driving trucks could be very well done in, in 10, 10, 15 years. Hundreds of thousands of people, and so on and so forth. So a, a huge amount of productivity increase, which means a lot of people are not going to have jobs. So the point is, it's going to be maybe in three or four decades, maybe 40% of the population are not going to have jobs. And it's not like now. Now, people say, oh, you don't have a job. Requalify yourself if you because you are going to get a job. Sorry, I'm very qualified. Man. We don't need people. I mean, this is what it is. So what, what are we going to do in a society? Is this totally different from before? We don't know what to do with people. They have skills, and they, you know, they don't need them. And also, it's going to change completely the political system. Today, all the political parties forever, they said, Vote for me. We're going to minimize lower unemployment, give you a job. Well, they are not going to be able to do that because it's, it's a structural thing. You cannot do it. So what do you do with people? 30% of the population, 40 what do you do? Guaranteed minimum income? This reminds me of what we learned about communism. 
You know, like everybody does. Well, maybe because there is, there is a lot of debate about that. People say, yeah, well, these people, let's do minimum income, but then they are going to, what do they do every day? They are going to be creative and do something else. Or maybe they're going to be on drugs. They are right now, a huge number of people are on drugs, which they used to have a job. The factory was exported to, to China. So this is a huge thing. I don't know if society is prepared for it. Even if the society is going to be able to support half of the society giving some minimum income, the other people say, well, I'm working on this guy. Look at the car this guy has. You know, oh, and I'm working, he's not. You know, so there are implications which I don't think society prepared, social concerns. And by the way, this is not most of our history, we were society in a Malthusian crisis, which means we're at the edge of not having enough to eat and die. And the society balanced itself in a rough way, but it balanced. Now it's not Malthusian. There is productivity to support pretty much everybody. It's inequalities of a different nature. So there are also ethical concerns which the society is not prepared for. And they are mostly uh, related to genetics. There are new discoveries. There are augmentations beyond medical necessity. This is a huge thing. What do you do? Uh, there are mental enhancements. I don't know, you probably heard the Prozac, uh, Ritalin. Are we, there are people, you know, they put you on Prozac so you, are, you don't feel any pain anymore, but you're kind of a zombie. If you read the Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, that's what they did, the, the so-called SOMA. Are we going to become a society like this? They, they solved the problem. Huxley was very clever. They had no problems in the society because everybody was happy. But they were, who knows? Is that human? Maybe not. Uh, genetic enhancements. This is, a, this is another very big thing. You know, there are now all kinds of developments. I don't have time to go into that. But uh, I'm going to take, uh, you, you know, they can now with uh, genetic uh, changes, they go inside of the embryo and, you know, not quite yet, but very close. Some of them they can do right now. But imagine they can do designer babies. You go to the parents and you know, I want to, something is, is happening right now, but they say, oh, I want blue eyes and do this and do that. And I want the IQ of, uh, can you stop that? You know what that can do? That can, it's a new threat of eugenics. I don't know if you are familiar with eugenics. Eugenics is a bad term now because of what happened in the Second World War. Eugenics was the idea developed, by the way, by socialists by 19th century in England, that uh, you, there are people who are uh, not very bright, they have too many kids, and the smart people, they don't have enough kids. So they try to you know, sterilize and minimize so people who are not fit for the society. And then what, whatever happened in the Second World War was, uh, in Germany. So eugenics, everybody said, no, 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 we don't want to talk about that. OK, that stopped. You know what this? This is a, it's an implicit threat of eugenics because as opposed to the one coming from the top the government wanted, it's going to come from the bottom. The parents want it. They already apply it right now. In China, for the last 20, 30 years, it was some sort of eugenics because they were able to look at the embryo. It uh, was the sex. And for cultural reasons, the Chinese do not want to have girls. And uh, they, they aborted a lot of girls, had lots of uh, boys. They were happy. And now, 30 years later, there are like thousands of guys not having wives. And, you know, and the wives are at high price. <laughs> it's, good to be, it's good to be a woman in China, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> they, they demand a, It's a huge imbalance in the society, just a simple thing. Imagine once the genetics uh, uh, develops, all kind of stuff is going to be eugenics. Uh, and they're going to create so much inequality in the society. So as I, I'm saying, ethical issues will be preeminent. And clearly, the existing theories are underwhelming. We, we are not prepared at all. So. Confusion and society's priorities. You've noticed all these things which I showed that are big things, they don't require any super intelligence to create. So when people talk existential threat, artificial super intelligence, forget about that. Look at how many threats we have and we are not prepared and serious problems. We have to acknowledge that our contemporary society seems to have lost its way to ability to prioritize. So where is humanity heading now? Remember what they said. That's what they believed. Well, I'm not so sure that that's true, based on what I talked about. 
How to explain the hype of singularity threats? Psychological escapism, substitute for taking responsibility for known difficult and unresolved problems of our contemporary society. People don't want to do that, and the celebrities are accentuating it. I don't believe we'll easily escape our human conditions, whatever they say. And because of that, and because of what all the things I showed you, I'm much more worried about this threat. <laughs> Do you know who these people are? I did that on purpose because it's in European Union. <laughs> this, is, this is Macron, this is, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's the interior minister of Italy. People are coming back not because we don't have, like in Malthusian society, what to eat. There are so many other things which are creating problems between people, and nobody's talking, nobody's working on it. So, but I don't want to be too pessimistic about it. That was more of a joke, because here is my, my call for action, basically. There are complex issues in a society confused by many distractions. We, as individuals, everybody, we have to go beyond hype, use critical thinking, and form an educated opinion about options and priorities. If there is something I want to convey to the audience is nobody's going to take care if you yourself don't. Believe me, it's acts through forums, think tanks, writing, social media, whatever you believe it is, to convince the decision makers, politicians, business leaders, to take the long-term view. And some of the celebrities to spend money to, to create debate forums and so on and so forth. Don't accept the hype and the escaping of celebrities, because if you don't get involved, someone else will make decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Man. Thank you very much, Dan. I don't know whether to be optimistic or pessimistic now, to be honest.